Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. teachers. This is the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton, and today we're talking about grit. You can find the full article that goes along with this episode at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 144. Well, hey there, beautiful teachers. Welcome to this episode of the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. This is a really important one where we're talking about grit and stick-to-itiveness, if you want to call it that, in our music teaching studios. So this is obviously really, really important because it takes a long time to learn a music instrument, if you haven't noticed. And if our students don't stay with us for the long term, and if they don't stay with problems in the short term, in other words, if they're not gritty, then they are not going to be able to make any progress and they're not going to be able to become lifelong musicians like we all want them to be, right? So how do we develop this grittiness if our students don't have it naturally? That's the question we're aiming to answer today. But before we get into that, I want to make sure you're subscribed to this show. If you're listening right now in iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or anywhere else, Make sure to subscribe so that you get the next one of these. And we have full articles that go along with each episode on our blog, which is at colorfulkeys.com, or you can use the short link that I mentioned at the start of the episode to get to that. Now let's talk about this idea of grit. First of all, let's just define what I'm talking about when it comes to grit, because this is a term that people might use casually, might use differently, or might not be familiar with at all. When I use the word grit, I'm really talking about the work of Angela Lee Duckworth. So I know it's a just a word that we all use, but she defined it pretty specifically. So Angela talks about grit as being passion and perseverance towards long-term goals. And you could kind of define that as most music people's journey through music, right? We have to have passion and perseverance towards a very long-term goal, being able to play the piano or the flute or the violin or sing beautifully is a long-term goal. It can't be achieved in the short term, and it does take determination. So this grittiness, I'm sure we've all encountered it in our studios, and I'm sure we've all encountered students who seem to lack it, right? Students who just give up on things really quickly. And I'm not talking here about students quitting, that's definitely a problem too, but the two tend to go hand in hand. So what we're really talking about today is how can we get students to stick at problems they encounter in their music studies in the short term, because that's what helps them to stick with it for the long term. Does that make sense? If you are able to work through a practice issue, you accomplish that goal. And that mini goal takes you towards the bigger goal of learning that full piece. And learning pieces and making progress is a big contributor to sticking with lessons over the long term. Before we even talk about how to develop this grit, let's talk about the other side of this. Because I'm sure you've encountered this too. And I'm sure or pretty sure you won't have thought about grit in this way. So let me tell you about my own habits growing up and the kind of student that I was. I was that child who, let's take age 11 as a little snapshot here. So if we go back to me at age 11, here are the activities that I was doing each week. I was doing modern dancing, so which was a mix of uh, things like skipping and stuff that you'd find in girl guides, but also modern jazz dancing, tap, and that kind of stuff. So that was a couple of hours. I was doing karate, and I was actually doing that directly after the modern dance. So those were back-to-back, I remember, on a Monday, because Mondays were insane. So I had those back-to-back. Karate, again, another hour and a half, I think, of karate. And then I had Irish dancing. I had been doing that a long time. I probably started Irish dancing when I was like five or six or so. And 
That I was doing twice, sometimes three times a week because I would be on a team that was preparing to travel. So when I was age 11, I was preparing for my first big European trip and we were going to be going to Slovakia, which meant we needed extra practices. So I had my regular Irish dancing. That would have been an hour and a half again, or almost two hours on a Wednesday. And I had extra dancing, which was a full half of a Sunday. And then sometimes an extra practice on top of that on a Saturday. Okay? With me so far? Then I had drama class, another few hours on a Saturday. I was, of course, learning piano. So I had my regular piano lesson. That's probably the shortest time requirement in my week. I think I was still in... No, I would have been moved up to 45 minutes at that stage, but still much shorter than the other ones. Within school, I was learning flute. So that was during my school day. I didn't stick with that, by the way. Don't ask me to play with anything on flute, but I did learn it up to a certain level. I also did swimming. That happened twice a week. You noticing a theme here? A lot of these things I was deeply committed to, so I was doing them twice a week. So swimming was twice. At some points later, actually, would have been three times a week. Luckily, thankfully, probably for many people around me, I didn't go onto the swimming team. I wasn't interested in competing, so I wasn't doing that every day, as many people in my school would have been. And then I was also doing orchestra before school on the flute. And hockey. When I was putting together this list, I left off hockey for a lot, long time, and then I suddenly remembered, oh yeah, I used to play hockey when I was still in primary school. So. That's my list, and I actually think I've missed a few things here. So you could describe that as extreme grit, couldn't you? I was so gritty. This wasn't because I just loved being so busy or some other reason. This was genuinely, I never wanted to quit anything. I had so much grit that I would stick to absolutely everything. And the reason I mention this is because it's kind of the other side of grit. And I think we need to bear it in mind when you have these students who are like me as an 11 year old. I mean, all the way through, this isn't, that was just a snapshot. I was like this my entire childhood and teen years. When you have students like that, maybe they are just extremely gritty. Let's keep that in mind. And there are so many upside to that. So yes, those students can be a nightmare because they're not going to practice as much as they should. And I certainly didn't for piano for many, many years until I got properly serious about it. So if you have students like that, maybe they're getting you down right now. But maybe we can flip how we think about it and think about them as being extremely gritty students. And although that part of it is frustrating, I think it's worth the trade-off. I consider grit to be my only natural talent. And I really mean that. I hate the word talent, as long-time listeners will know. And when I say I hate the word talent, I really mean that I hate the word natural talent or the the idea of natural talent. Not because I believe it doesn't exist. It does, okay? People are naturally better at one thing or another due to genetics. That's fine. I'm not disputing that. I just think it's a much smaller contributor to anything than people usually behave as if it is, right? So my hate of this word comes from the fact that someone will play something. So say you see a wee nine-year-old and they play something, you know, moderately impressive. Play something from Schumann's album for the young or something. And the adult says, oh my gosh, they are so talented. And I just am crawling on my skin because I'm thinking what I want to do is turn around to that adult and say, no. They have worked really hard, practiced consistently for four years by the time they got to age nine and were able to play that piece. So don't you dare call them talented because I feel you're taking away some of the work they put in. And I strongly suspect that in the back of, or subconsciously, I would say, the reason adults do this or like to say that someone is gifted or talented is because they don't want to put in that work. And if they say that, they can say as a follow-up, oh, I was just, it was just never for me, or I was never able for piano. 
You were, you just didn't work at it. And that's fine. It wasn't your passion, right? Coming back to that passion and perseverance towards long-term goals. If it isn't your passion, that's fine. I'm not saying everyone has to learn to play the piano. Although wouldn't the world be beautiful if we could all play piano? Anyway, I'm not saying we have to all learn to play piano. What I am saying is you shouldn't dismiss something as being natural talent. And so that tangent leads me back to my one true natural talent because I am not musically gifted or talented. I am not coordinated. (laughs) And to hear all that dancing and karate that was happening in my week, you would think that I was. No, I am not naturally coordinated. In fact, yeah, I'm very, very clumsy person. And many other, I guess you could say shortcomings, although I don't feel them that way. But my one natural ability, my one natural talent, is that I stick with stuff. And that can be to my detriment, sure. I can build up this mass of activities that mean that my poor dear mother has to cart me all around the Dublin suburbs when I'm 11. But it also means that I stick at things until I get them, and I end up succeeding where someone else who was much more naturally gifted wouldn't. So this is my superpower, as I consider it anyway. I think it's my only natural gift or superpower. And I want to give that to the next generation. I want to pass along my superpower of grit. And I don't believe that anything is set in terms of how naturally gifted or talented we are at something. And that being set in stone, most things can be cultivated and developed And I think this is one that's worth developing. So here's what I'm going to be sharing with you today in terms of developing this. I've come up with seven different aspects or related skills that I believe can help students to develop grit. Okay? So these are not, first of all, they're not come up, but Angela Lee Duckworth didn't come up with these. They're not official published guidelines by her or any such thing. They are my estimation of what I believe are the most relevant skills for developing grit in the context of a music studio through my own research. Now, I came up with them as as seven, and I wanted to keep things simple for all of us to remember. So they're going to be based on the first seven letters of the alphabet, otherwise known as the music alphabet, right? Keep it easy, keep it simple for us to all understand. So these are the seven elements that I think can help music students to develop grit and that music teachers can truly work on when it comes to developing grit. We have A is for almost, B is for brain, C is for conscious, D is for delight, E is for exhale, F is for flagrant, and G is for glorify. So let's unpack each one of those, starting with almost. Now, each of these is amplified. Is that a word? Anyway, we'll go with it. Each of these is amplified by a different character. And these characters are featured in our Gritty Critter series that we're releasing back-to-back months all this year. So we've already released several at the time of this episode, and there's more on the way. And they're not in this exact order, by the way, but the characters are the same. So almost the character that goes along with that in our Gritty Critter series is the Yeti. And it's the Yeti because almost is about not yet, right? Which uh, Carol Dweck, who's the growth mindset woman, she talks about as, as the magic words, not yet. So saying something is not there yet is magic because it helps you to develop that growth mindset. That's really what this is about. The idea of almost is that your students understand that they are not fixed, they are not stuck where they are, that they can get better, that their abilities are not set in stone. And the word yet, you will have heard it added onto the ends of sentences and things, I'm sure, by other teachers. For instance, my Irish dancing teacher, who we mentioned, or we mentioned the Irish dancing earlier. So she would do this all the time. You would say, 
oh, I just can't do it, or I can't get it. And she would go, yet. In fact, long-term students, of which I was one, would be able to chime in right with her, right? You would hear someone, because it was a mixed-level class, and there would be young kiddos there, and they would say that, and the older students would turn around right with our teacher and say, yet, all together. And it feels a bit corny. In fact, I thought it was at the time, right? You think it's, okay, yeah, I get it, and you kind of roll your eyes at it, but it actually ends up sticking. Even when students roll their eyes at these kinds of things, they actually can make a difference. Okay, so persist with it. Now, working on the idea of yet, in our game, which is about the yeti, which we have already released inside Vibrant Music Teaching, we talk about hidden yets, not just actually adding the word yet to the end of sentences, but we work on hidden yet statements. Like, this is going to take a lot of practice, right? That implies that if you practice, you will get it. So training our students to use these almost or hidden yet statements is really, really useful towards developing growth mindset, which is really an integral part of grit. I mean, Angela Lee Duckworth was inspired by Carol Dweck. She greatly admires her research. So grit really is born of the growth mindset research in a way, although they're separate concepts. And so developing that growth mindset in our students is really important. Now on to B. B is for brain. Okay, so this one might sound a bit weirder to you. But the B for brain... A character in our Gritty Critter series is called the Periton, and the Periton is very, very cautious. If you're not familiar with the mythical creature of the Periton, it is half bird, half deer. So as you can imagine, deer stuck in the head, caught in the headlights, right? It's a very cautious creature. And so we talk about the Periton trying to get across your brain. It's going from the left to the right hemisphere. By the way, I understand just in case there's any neuroscientists listening, I understand I'm oversimplifying things, but this is still a very useful way to think about our own thoughts, yeah? It's a useful metacognition tool, even if making pathways from the left to the right is not fully the whole picture, okay? So the periton is trying to get from the left to the right of the brain, or vice versa, and to make those pathways really strong, we need repetition. Because if we don't go over and over that path, the periton will not walk across it because he's so cautious, right? He doesn't, he, oh, there's a crumbling stone over there. He won't step on it. So that is the idea behind the brain. It's really metacognition and understanding the importance of repetition, why that actually matters. We need to repeat things over and over and visualizing your own brain and these powerful paths that you're making in it makes that so much more palatable to students and can really help them to stick at things because they understand that, yes, the first repetition will not go well because I'm still building that path. C, as I said, is for conscious. And you might also call this the mindfulness one, right? So I talk about this in the Gritty Critters series as being the dragon. And the reason it's the dragon is the dragon above all things, wants to guard the treasure. And to do that, the dragon needs to sit on the treasure. She needs to sit on it and enclose her little wings around it and guard her treasure. And the treasure in piano lessons is the music you're making. However, the enemy here is when you decide to go flying, right? So your mind drifts off and you start thinking about other things and your little dragon starts flying up away from the treasure. The dragon is really about distractions. That's what the enemy is. It's about distracting thoughts that take us away from the music. What it is not about, though, is saying we must never, ever get distracted. We must stay on task. It's not that kind of militant thinking. It's about acknowledging that you got distracted, acknowledging that you thought about pizza, and then coming back into the present and thinking instead about the music you're making, or about the feel of your fingers on the keys, or the feel of your pedal under your foot, or even the air in the room. It's about coming back into the moment, in other words, being 
conscious, which, which is why this is C. Our next one is D, and this is for delight. And it's about delighting in the difficult, delighting in the challenges. So this is the hippogriff in our Gritty Critter series. The hippogriff, if you're not familiar with the hippogriff, come on, read Harry Potter, what are you even doing? Anyway, if you're not familiar with the hippogriff, it is top half bird, bottom half horse, okay? So periton is half deer, half bird. This is horse and bird, okay? The important thing to know about hippogriffs is that in order to get to get on their back, right, because they're a horse, and they can take you and fly up in the sky, if you want to be able to do that, you have to show confidence and look them in the eye and then bow. So that's what we're doing to difficulty and challenges. We are delighting in them and we're showing confidence. So the D for delight is all about looking at the challenges in their face. So looking at the new piece and saying, this is going to be challenging because I've never done semi-quavers before. Or this is going to be challenging because I've never seen that left-hand pattern before. Or I've never played that quickly or any other reason. Look at that challenge together. Acknowledge why it's difficult. And then say what's exciting about it. So if you've never seen semi-quavers before, great, you get to learn about a new note value that's going to make rhythms more interesting, or it's going to mean that you're able to learn some fantastic piece that uses semi-quavers that you've always wanted to learn. So we're looking at it in the eye, we're not shying away from it and saying, oh no, it'll be easy. We're saying, yes, it is difficult, this is why, but this is why we're excited to overcome that challenge. So that's D for delight, and that is the hippogriff. (laughs) The next one is E, and that's for exhale. This is something sort of inspired by the work of Noah Kageyama, who is the blogger behind The Bulletproof Musician. If you guys haven't read that blog, it is awesome. So what Noah does over there is he takes mostly scientific studies. A lot of them are actually in the area of sports, but sometimes they're music-specific. And he breaks down what the study actually said and how it can apply to us in our practice. So it's really fantastic because, let's face it, the likes of you or me probably is not going to read those studies in the journals. But Noah does, and he makes them accessible to us. And one of the things he talked about was about taking a moment between repetitions. This sounds so basic, but it's something actually that I'm sure once you start noticing it, you'll realize your students do not do. They will, or at least certain students, I always did this instinctively, I think, but certain students, I have noticed, will, you'll say, okay, work on that bit, and they're very good about repeating it, and they're perfectly happy to do that, but they will do it straight after, like, literally the next beat, as if there is no break between. So they're actually practicing doing it back to back, first of all, which makes no sense because they would never go from the end of that to the start of that. That's not a muscle memory that they should be building, right? But other than that, it also gives them no time to reflect on how that version of it went, that rendition of it, and what they want to do in the next take. So they don't set any intention. And that means that they're just bashing through it basically and they're not getting anywhere most of the time. So exhale is about a breath between repetitions and in the Gritty Critty series this is the phoenix so we visualize we close our eyes and we visualize the phoenix you know catching flames and then getting born again and that's what should be happening each time. It really can help with frustration levels as well as just efficiency because you're listening to or you're seeing it as a fresh start each time. So that one has gone up in flames, literally. It's gone now. You already tried it that time. So you learn what you can from that. And then you repeat it, but fresh. And you set that intention before you do. So the simplest way to start bringing this in is simply a breath. And with your younger students, I wouldn't even start by talking about the reflection issue at all. I would just enforce a sort of rule or a habit 
that in between repetitions, we inhale and exhale. And then you can talk about the visualization of the phoenix. And then you can add a step to set a goal for this repetition or call your shot, as they would talk about in Practice Perfect, which is a book that is all about practice in a much broader context than music. It's actually written by some teachers. But it's meant to be applicable to absolutely everything, basically, because everyone has to practice in some capacity. So they talk about calling your shot. And I think that's a really useful way to think about this as well, especially if sports students, you don't just play it again randomly. You call your shot. You say, this time I'm going to try and play it at this speed. Or this time I'm going to aim to have perfect shape for my fifth finger or whatever right? You call your shot before you play it. But start with the breath, then add maybe the phoenix in that visualization so you reduce the frustration levels, and then add calling your shot or setting intentions. We have two more to go. F is probably the one you were most confused by when I (laughs) previewed each of these, and that is flagrant. What? Why should our students be flagrant? I chose this word yes to be a bit silly, but it's really about being unabashed about making mistakes. I know you've had students like this who apologize every two seconds throughout an entire piece. Have you had those students? They just will not stop saying sorry or going, oh, oh, or something like that. And they're ruining us listening to the piece. Like, doesn't it just ruin the whole thing? I don't care about wrong notes. I honestly don't. Yeah, I'm going to try and help them fix them. But really, I don't care. It doesn't bother me to hear a wrong note. That's not offensive. But you apologizing, that really gets in the way of me enjoying it. And also, there is no need because I don't care about the wrong note. So talking with your students about the fact that they are going to make mistakes and that those are how they learn and that there is literally nothing to apologize for. Our critter that goes along with this is the unicorn. And the reason I chose the unicorn is because we talk about the unicorn practicing her magic, okay? So she's practicing her magic, and she absolutely never apologizes for getting glitter all over your face because she did her magic wrong, right? Or maybe not all over your face, but making a mistake with her magic. What she will apologize for, though, is if she steps on your shoe. So we're not sending the message that we don't apologize for stuff that actually bothers other people, even if it was a mistake. We're just not apologizing for things that don't offend or bother anyone, (laughs) like playing wrong notes in music. So the last letter we have, of course, is G. That's where the music alphabet stops. I'm sure you know that. So it is about glorifying. And this is something I'm so guilty of not doing enough of. And I do add it regularly, and then I neglect it for a while, and then I add it back in. This is about reflecting with your students and talking about all the things that they have accomplished so far. It is so important and it's so easy not to do it. It's so easy to just keep going to the next level because as teachers, a lot of us are very success focused or progress focused where we want our students to keep getting better and we want to see them moving up in books and moving up to the next piece and doing this and doing that. But we need to look back as well, because if they never get to see how much they've done, they don't have the motivation to keep going forward. And this is a huge, huge part of being gritty. And it's something that gritty people, I feel, maybe do a little bit more naturally, is looking back at where they came from and seeing the progress themselves. But a lot of people need this pointed out to them. A lot of students do, especially younger ones. No, not especially younger ones in this case. Let's just say everyone. Everyone could use more moments where their teacher says, Oh my gosh, you can totally play that piece on your first try. And do you remember the first time you learned a piece that used that concept? It took us five weeks to learn it. And they will not remember. Most of the time they won't. So then you take out that previous piece and and they say, Oh yeah, I remember first looking at this. This looked so hard. And now I look at it and it looks easy. Or taking those moments to take out their first piano book and put it up on the stand and play something. Play something they used to find challenging. 
because as I said at the beginning, music is such a long-term journey. It is so not immediate and it's so easy to forget where you came from, you know, when you're six months in or three years in or ten years into your journey. So important to look back and glorify the past successes, where you came from. So those are our seven letters. I hope that gave you a little tour and a idea of where to start with this idea of developing grit. Now, you're not going to take each one of these letters and just apply them right away, immediately, just based on this podcast. I do realize this, but it gives you an overview and a starting spot for thinking. If you're a member of Vibrant Music Teaching, I hope you'll use the games we've released so far and the games we're continuing to release on this concept to bring this into your studio in a way that is truly accessible for you and your students and makes it super fun. It is so fun to work with these mythical creatures and it opens up so many doors to conversations as well with your students about issues surrounding this, right? Things that stem from these these different concepts. So I hope that you'll use those if you're a Vibrant Music Teaching member. If you're not a member, of course, you can sign up at vibrantmusicteaching.com. But before I close it out here, there's one more thing I want to talk to you about. And this is about why this is so important. It's not just important because it'll help our students become lifelong musicians, because we want to pass on our superpower if you're in the same boat as me. It's important because we want to make things more fair, more equal. My mission in music teaching, why I do most of the things that I do in my life, is about making music more truly inclusive. And I hesitate to use that word sometimes because people narrow it down. So they think that I mean special needs when I say inclusive. Or they think that I mean racial issues. And I do mean both those things, and both those are intertwined with what I'm talking about. But I truly mean all-encompassing inclusive. That everyone who wants to learn music should be able to. And yes, that means addressing many inequality issues that come up in our societies, but it also means addressing the way we teach music to be more welcoming of those who come from outside our world, quote unquote. Because if you find ways to take in students of every background, every ethnicity, but their parents didn't study music and all of your white students have parents who did study music or at least had exposure to that, your white students are going to be the most successful. (laughs) That's the truth of it. And that's just one issue, right? That's just taking race as an example. So when I talk about inclusivity, and I may do a podcast episode specific about this, but when I talk about it, I'm being much broader, just to be clear on that, which is why this idea of grit is so important to inclusivity. Because if you try and make music more accessible to students who don't have parents who studied music or who had friends who studied music, then you need to get serious about developing grit with your students and going beyond just the standard music lesson stuff. Because yes, one of the differences between our students could be that some have more inbuilt grit, like I believe I probably do. And that's kind of random, right? The DNA is kind of random. Some students are grittier, some are less gritty. Fine. But then there are other two other sides to developing grit and being gritty. And they are, number one, independence. That is, that some students have more support in developing grit. So some have to do this basically by themselves, often through no fault of their parents, just because their parents are busy or there's other things going on or they just don't have the tools to be able to help them with this. And then the other aspect of this is just that they need an unequal amount of grit. So if you have no friends who study music, if you have parents who are not there to support your home practice, if you have other things going on in your life, you need more grit than that child who has a parent who study piano up to grade eight themselves and sits with you every day during practice and is around a lot more. And you also have lots of friends who also study piano and it's completely normal to you. You need less grid in that situation. 
So while it's an admirable goal to develop grit no matter what your motivation, I hope you'll consider how important it is based on this inclusivity factor as well. Let me know your thoughts on this. Let me know if you disagree with me about any of these aspects of grit or how we should develop it. I would absolutely love to hear from you. You can find me through Instagram, we're at Colourful Keys, or in the Vibrant Music Studio Facebook group. And I'd love to hear from you. Chat to you there. One of the awesome benefits for Vibrant Music Teaching members is that they get an exclusive member magazine every month. This magazine brings together our blog articles in a way that is digestible and super actionable. If you want to become a member and get the magazine as well as all the other benefits, you can go to vmt.ninja to sign up.